right, hello everyone. Welcome, welcome. Thanks for joining us this morning, whether you're in this room live with us or joining us online. Thanks for, thanks for coming to be a part of our service today as we gather in community with one another and we're seeking out God together to connect with God, to connect with one another in community. So let's get started. Go ahead and stand up if you're able. We're gonna sing some songs to glorify and worship our God. He is worthy of our praise today. So let's get going. Here we go.
this is our first time together since uh, Resurrection Sunday last week. And in that service last Sunday for Easter Sunday, we, we learned a new song together called What He's Done, which is all about what Jesus Christ has done on our behalf. So we're going to sing that song again today. But just to introduce it and help us all reflect on what Jesus has done for us, I wanted us to hear this passage from the book of Philippians. So let's listen together. This is from Paul's letter to the Philippians. He says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's sing together. Future is heaven. 
sing when I survey. When I survey the wondrous cause on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have seen fit to give us the amazing gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his sacrifice. We thank you for his life and his teachings. We thank you that after he died on the cross that you raised him to life again through your power and that he is alive in heaven interceding on our behalf and making it possible for us to be called your children. We thank you and we praise you, God. Would you work now in our hearts as we have this time together? Would you speak to us? Give us ears that can truly hear. Pray these things in Jesus' name together. Amen. Hello, good morning, friends. Nice to see you. Please have a seat, have a seat. Hello to all of y'all in the room. Thanks for joining us. All of our friends online, we're glad that you are here. Well, hey, you survived a blizzard this week, right? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a blizzard in April, the joys of the Midwest. So uh, uh, we're glad that you're here. Thanks for being here. Hey, I, 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 one quick thing before we uh, hand it off to Charles for a message today. Alpha has been happening. If you've not heard of Alpha, Alpha is a course, it, it, it's a series of weeks of talks, right? And Alpha, whether you are new to faith or you're pondering questions, uh, right, Alpha is made for you. There, uh, there are videos that are played, and then the rest of the time is just conversation. And they talk about things like who Jesus is, what the Bible is, faith, life, all that. So if this is something that you're interested in, we'd love to connect. We'd love to uh, get you connected. The course only started last week, but it goes through until May 23rd here at Brady Way. We'd love to uh, uh, just connect with you on that. But also, if you are new, if this is your first time here, we'd love to connect with you. Head on out to our next steps outside these doors, straight out there. You'll see a big sign that says next steps. We'd love to meet you guys, too. All right, friends, I'm going to pass off to Charles for our message today. Hi, everybody. My name is Charles. I'm one of the pastors on the teaching team. Uh, we are in the middle of a sermon series called Faith in Action. Um, it's, it's focused on this one book in the Bible written by Jesus' brother, James. The book is also called James. And, and this book is a hard-hitting book. Every Sunday in the series so far, the, the speaker has come up and kind of gave kind of, kind of a warning. Right? So remember, right? James is not the pastor walking alongside you. Hey, how you doing? How's it going? How's everything going for you? That's not James. No, 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 no. James, um, he's been described as a physical therapist, <laughs> maybe a bit of a drill sergeant, right? He's like, okay, I want what's good for you, but I'm going to tell it like it is to help you get there, right? And so, so he set us straight on, on a number of topics so far in the series. Um, he says, hey, you need to have a different kind of wisdom. You need to learn to see the trials and sufferings in your life as sources of joy, because that's going to help you become mature. He then says, hey, true religion, hmm, not what you do, not a bunch of religious stuff you do in, inside the church building. No, 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 no. True religion is about taking care of the powerless in their moments of distress and making sure you're not shaped or molded by the world around you. And then, hey, Christian community, James says, no room for playing favorites. No discrimination. And then James takes a quick break, right? He takes a pause. He's like, okay, I'm sure you have all kinds of questions about all this talk about action, action, action. What about faith? So James says, okay, true faith requires action. A faith that does not require action doesn't do anything. And then uh, right before Easter, James reminds us of the power of our words. You need to control what you say because your words can destroy the lives of others around you and your own life. And then we took a break for Easter, and today we come back to the book of James, and James is going to keep on going. Today he's going to tell you how to plan your life. Yeah. And usual warning applies. Um, you're going to hear some words from James that's going to make you very uncomfortable. And, um, and if you're willing to listen... He is going to ask you to, to take a serious look at yourself. Okay. So, let's get started. Today we're looking at the book of James, chapter 4. We're looking at verses 13 through 17. And those, for those of you keeping track, uh, we're actually skipping a few passages because the main ideas in those passages we've touched on in other Sundays. So, if you have your Bible, go to verse 13 of chapter 4 of James. James says, Now listen. You who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city. Spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. 
All right, so James starts off by talking about a particular group of people, and in the first century, this would be a group of people who are the merchants. Right? He, he says to the merchants, okay, uh, and now these merchants are people who travel from city to city and they run businesses and they, and they buy and sell goods. Now there are scholars who, who argue that, that these merchants are actually not uh, Christ followers, um, but I think the better reading is that these merchants are indeed Christ followers. So what are these Christ following merchants doing? Well, they're making business plans, right? We're gonna move to the city, set up a business, spend a year there doing trade, and make some profit. Now, some of you are thinking, what's wrong with that? Right? Like, we make plans like this all the time. We make plans like this all the time, right? I'm, um, I'm going to graduate this May. I'm going to move to this city and get a job there. I'm getting married this summer, and then we're going to, you know, take a road trip across the country. We're planning to have a baby next year. Maybe we're thinking about buying a house, you know, trying to figure out our credit, credit scores. Um, I want to start a business. I got a business loan already, and I'm hiring people. Or we're going to retire this fall, and we're going to move closer to where our grandchildren are. We make plans, big ones, little ones, tomorrow, next week, a month out, a year out. We make plans like this. So what's the problem, James? Well, he tells you. The problem? Arrogance. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes, all such boasting is evil. The Greek word for boast there is kakaomai. It means to have confidence. It means to rely on something. It means to go, yeah, I, 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 I feel confident about this. And so James is not happy with the merchants because these merchants don't have confidence in God. They're not relying on God. No, they have confidence in their arrogant schemes. Now here, I'm not entirely happy with the NIV translation. Because the NIV translation um, for arrogant scheme, the, the Greek word underlying that, the arrogant schemes is actually alazoneia. Alazoneia, which is just one word. It doesn't mean arrogant schemes. It just means arrogance. You will find actually this translation quite often in, in, in quite a few English Bibles. It will just say, you boast in your arrogance. I think that's the better translation. So what is arrogance? What does James mean by alazoneia? Well, Elizaneum means this. Elizaneum refers to the one who makes more of himself than the reality justifies, ascribing to himself either more and better things than he has or even what he does not possess at all. Do you see this definition? Do you understand arrogance or Elizaneum? It is to have a fundamental misunderstanding of oneself is to think more highly of oneself than what reality justifies. And so James says to the merchant, okay, you, your planning reveals a lot of confidence, okay? You have confidence, but your confidence is based on a fatal misunderstanding of who you are. Your planning is based on a misunderstanding. So what is the misunderstanding? why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. Simple point, obvious point. You do not know what will happen tomorrow. You think you do, right? You think you have power, you think you have control, and that causes you to plan the way you do, but you do not know. Back in 1999, um, David Dunning and Justin Kruger um, did a study, they, they got a bunch of people and they, and they had them take a test on a particular topic. And then they asked these people to rank how well they think they did on the test uh, relative to other people who were taking it. And so he, this is their result. The red line is the actual performance, this is how they actually did on the test, and the blue line is their perception of how well they did relative to other people. And so what's interesting is you start from here, this is the this is the bottom quartile. This is the, the people who score the lowest. They're the bottom 25%. They thought they were in the 60 percentile, okay? And as we move up in terms of doing better on the test, they're getting closer to their estimates, but they still overestimate how well they did. This pattern continues until you get to the very top quartile. The, the people who did the, absolutely the best on the test, well, they actually go ahead and uh, underestimate how well they did. So this, this, 
the, 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 the big idea of this test is that the, the less you know about something, the more likely you are to overestimate how much you know. And this study has been reproduced and confirmed over and over again. This effect, this gap right here, this effect, is known as the Dunning-Kruger effect. This is the actual res a, 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 a data, set, data, data results from their study. But um, this, this graph is academic. It's kind of dry. It doesn't have pizzazz, right? It doesn't pop. And so somebody translated this graph for the internet, for the memes. And so <laughs> Dave, David Dunning actually denies any responsibility to this graph. But if you Google Dunning-Kruger effect, you will find some version of this graph. And, 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 and seriously, at the end of this talk, if you remember this Dunning-Kruger effect at all, you will remember this one and not the previous one. And, and here's why. Uh, it's memorable. It has like really cool labels like Mount Stupid and Valley of Despair. That's just cool, right? And second, this graph is intuitive. It matches our experience. Like, like when we, when we, know, we start, start knowing nothing, right? As we get to know something, we know something, what happens? Well, you heard the saying, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, right? We get excited. We're like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Oh wow, and, and I, 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 I got all the, I got this, I got this. And what happens is you gain all this confidence about what you know, but in reality, what you're doing is you're racing up the peak of Mount Stupid. <laughs> and then what happens? You gain a little more knowledge. You learn a little bit more and you're like, oh. There's a lot to this. <laughs> it is way too much. And so what happens? Your confidence crashes, and you end up here in the valley of despair. And you're like, how can I possibly learn all this? And that's where many of us actually just give up on whatever it is we're trying to learn. This is intuitive. We get this, right? All right. And so what, what James is saying is to the merchants is, look, like, you, you're here. You're living here. You know a little bit about tomorrow. You don't know much. But, but somehow, you have this huge confidence. You have this massive gap between what you think you know and reality. You are living on the top of Mount Stupid. But why, why? You're sitting up there making all these plans, and I'm just going to be blunt, James says to the merchants. You might not even make it to tomorrow. What is your life? I'm going to translate it. What is your life? Who the heck do you think you are? Is what James says to the merchants. Who are you? That's you. That's you. That's you. You're a mist. Okay. Let's, let's, let's watch mists trying to make plans. Next week, we're going to go. Let's try that again. It's kind of that's nice. Next year, we're going to, it's kind of funny, right, watching Miss trying to make plans. It's a bit silly. That's James's point. You merchants, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You have very little control over tomorrow, and you may not make it to tomorrow. So why do you plan the way you do? How are you guys doing? James is pretty brutal, right? He is direct. And what he has to say to us is simple and straightforward. Okay. We need to know who we are. This, this is who we are. We're here. When it comes to the future, when it comes to tomorrow, all of us are here. All of us are here. The question that James is posing to us is, are you going to live up here? Are you going to live on the top of Mount Stupid? Are you going to pretend that you know things, that you control the future? Or are you going to live down here? Live a life in accordance with who you know you are. That is the question. 
Now, the question we have is, what does it mean to live down here? What does it mean to live a life and plan our lives appropriate to how much we know? Uh, so, one of the reactions people have to this passage, one of the reactions people have to this passage is, hey, um, um, maybe the solution is I just shouldn't plan. Right? I shouldn't plan anything. That, that's a way to do it, right? Don't plan anything. Because planning is evil. Planning is bad. Planning is, is, is arrogance. I'm, I'm going against the will of God. That's bad. Don't plan. I, I actually met many Christ followers that way. Right? They say don't plan. But the problem with that is that's not actually what James says. Look what James says. Verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. If it is the Lord's will, we will do this or that. What's that? That's planning, right? That is actually planning. James is not saying don't plan. James is not saying, oh, don't plan is how, to, how, how not to be arrogant. James is not saying, hey, live your life as it come. No, he says, but James says, by all means, plan, but plan without arrogance. So how do you plan without arrogance? You plan without arrogance if you plan in accordance with the Lord's will. All right, obvious next question. What does that mean? Right. Now, now, here, I, I, I worry that I'm going to ruffle some feathers because um, there, there's a, there are people, there are Christ followers, who read this verse literally. What I mean by that is they, 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 they read this verse saying that James is saying that whenever we talk about the future, we should always throw in the phrase, if it is the Lord's will. We should say it. We need to say that. And, and, and what they say is, go ahead and plan the way you want. Plan anything you want, do whatever you want, but as long as you say this phrase, then it's all okay. Okay? So this is where I go on a rant about magical thinking. Uh, when I say magic, I don't mean David Copperfield, I don't mean sleight of hand. When I say magic, I'm talking about Harry Potter magic. Right? Magic is using words or phrases or objects or incantations or rituals or, or you know, kind of thing to manipulate the physical and the spiritual realm. And Christianity is non-magical because God is personal. There is nothing we can do or say to make God do anything. This is foundation to our faith. Right? God's like, you can't make me do anything I don't want to do. That's just foundational to who we are. The problem is magical thinking is popular. Right? We, 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 we like magical thinking, so it kind of infiltrates into Christian thinking sometimes. And I meet Christ, meet Christ followers who, who, who will say things like, hey, when you pray, you got to say amen at the end. Or you got to say in Jesus' name. If you don't say those things, then it doesn't work. The, the prayer doesn't count. Right? That's, that's magical thinking. Same way with this. Right? If you just say, if it's the Lord's will, then it's all okay. All right. Now, first of all, there's nothing wrong with saying, if it's the, Lord, it's the Lord's will. Okay? Nothing wrong at all. As long as the understanding is, that's not a magical phrase, that's covering up arrogance. Because you can't solve arrogance through magical phrases. Okay. So, what is James saying here? He says, plan in accordance with God's will. By all means, plan in accordance with God's will. In fact, James says exactly the same thing in verse 17. He just phrased it in a, in, a, in a negative way. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. This is phrased in a negative way. If you turn around and make it positive, it says, figure out the good you should be doing, implied plan, plan it, and then go do it. Right? Verse 15 says, plan in accordance with the will of God, and do the good you know you're supposed to do. These two verses are the foundation for planning without arrogance. Now, this whole idea goes against our culture. Because right? our culture says, I'm in charge of my life. Our culture says, the goal of my life is to, to live it in a way to express my individuality. Right? I'm in charge 
of the direction of my life. I am the master of my universe. That's what our culture says. And James says, that entire way of thinking is life on the top of Mount Stupid. Because we do not know, we do not have power to control, and we may not even live to see tomorrow. So how should we plan? James says, plan in accordance with God's will because, look, God knows the future. So if your, pl your plans are meshing with his, that's going to work out well. And, and even if you don't live to see tomorrow, the plans you put in place, the things you got going on, if they're matching up with God's, God can use them. What you leave behind, God can leverage for his purposes. Okay? That's planning without arrogance. That's planning without arrogance. So let's get practical. How do we plan in accordance with God's will? This is one of the biggest questions I get when I do Q&R with people. They ask me, like, how do I know the will of God? And usually it's, it's, surrounding, it's surrounding some big decisions in life. Oh, should I go to this city? Should I, should I get, take this job? Should I marry this person? Some big things going on in their lives. And when people ask about these kind of questions, Often, not always, often, there's something else behind these questions, right? The, 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 what's behind these questions, there is this idea that, that God has a specific will for my life, that, that I'm supposed to take certain steps, like I'm supposed to take this job, I'm supposed to marry this person, I am supposed to move to this city, that, that this path is laid out for me individually, specifically for me, by God, that this is an, a path that is ideal for me. We have this idea of an ideal path. And, and, the, and the challenging thing about this is that God didn't write it down, right? God didn't tell us what the ideal path is. So a lot of the Christian life becomes what? It becomes, well, I'm a detective looking for clues, right? I'm trying to make a decision. I'm like, oh, well, I just dreamt something the other day. Maybe God's telling me something. Or, or I'm, I, I just heard something on the radio that matches what a friend says, that matches what I read the other day. Oh, maybe that's a clue. So we're trying to put clues together to figure out what is this ideal path so I can make my big decision. Sound familiar? Kind of? Okay. I'm about to say something that make people angry. And, and it's okay you disagree with me. Just come and talk to me. We can, figure, we can talk this through, okay? But I'm going to say it anyway. Um, this entire idea that we're supposed to go looking for this ideal path. What is the right job? Where, what city I should move to? Who I should marry? This in, the entire concept is non-Christian. It's pagan. It's fortune-telling. It's astrology. It's divination. It's tarot card. It's crystal ball. It's palm reading. It's, it's reading tea leaves. Throughout history, in almost every culture, there have been seers and oracles who claim to be able to see into the spiritual realm and get help from somewhere to figure out what is your ideal path. And this happens in almost in every ancient religion. This is the core. Why? Because we humans are scared about the future. We are, we are scared. We don't know the future. We want some guarantees. I want to make sure I'm not making a bad mistake. So what do we do? We, we want this from our religion. We, want, we go to the gods, we go to the stars, we go to the spiritual realm to tell us, give us some guarantees so we can make decisions with certainty. That's what we want. But here's the problem. The Bible unequivocally condemns divination, fortune-telling, astrology, lot-casting, all of that in its entirety. So what do we Christians do? Because we still want that. We still want that certainty about the future. So we come up with this idea of the ideal path, which is not in the Bible, but we connect it to this phrase that is in the Bible, the will of God, which is a bit ironic because the ideal path is something we want, and we connect it to the will of God, which is what God wants. Okay, so a bit ironic. So... Let me just lay it out. Let me say it straight forward. God does not have an ideal path for your life. Okay? I'm just going to say it straight out. This is, the Bible does not teach this. Okay? But 
God does have a will for your life. God has a will for your life. It is not an ideal path, but it is something that he wants for your life. When you look at the word God's will, okay, you're getting at what does God want. And what does God want for you? What does God want for your life? Well, if I'm asking that question, the answer is obvious. The Bible is clear on this. God wants three things for your life. Number one, God wants transformation. God cares less about what you do and more about who you become. I'm going to say that again. God cares less about what you do and more about who you become. If you look through the Bible looking for passages that's going to tell you, you know, what city I should move to, what job I should take, or what person I should marry, you're going to look in vain. But if you go to the Bible looking for the person I should become, you'll be reading all day. You'll be reading all day. In fact, in fact, the, the book we're in, the book of James, that's a book about what God wants from your life. The book of James is God's will for your life. So, God, so, so develop a wisdom that helps you to see trials and suffering as sources of joy. That's God's will for your life. Taking care of the, those who are powerless, making sure you're not shaped by the world around you, that's God's will for your life. Making sure that our community does not do discrimination, does not do favoritism, that's God's will for your life. Control your tongue. Watch out for the things you say. That's God's will for your life. So when you wake up tomorrow morning and you ask yourself a question, what does God want for me today? What is God's will for my life today? The answer is, my job, my primary job, is to image God. It's to learn to know him more, learn to trust him more, and learn to reveal more who he is to the world around me. That's your primary calling. Number one. Number two, community. God doesn't just transform you individually. He is pulling you into his body, the body of Jesus Christ. He's connecting you and knitting you together with other Christ followers. He wants you to put you in a place where you know and love and you are known and you're loved. So God wants you to be part of a local church and he wants you to care about his church. That's God's will for your life. Number three, mission. God wants you to be on mission with him. God wants you to be his partner on his mission to redeem this world. I mean, Jesus came to our world. He loved the world so much, he came to the world and died for this world. God says, I want you to love the world the way I love the world. And God wants you to take your gifts and your talents, mold them together with God's people for the sake of the mission. Transformation, community, mission. That's God's will for your life. The Bible's crystal clear on this, okay? That's God's will for your life. Now, you know, the question I have is for somebody who says, you know, I, I actually don't prioritize those things. I, right? if, if you don't prioritize those things, three things in your life, and you're like, but I still want, it. I still want God's help in making, helping me make decisions, my question is, why? Right? Because what you're doing is you're treating God as a fortune teller. You're asking God to give you the perfect road for your life. So you can live a prosperous future with certainty and with guarantees. And God's like, I don't offer tarot card services. That's not who I am. Now, some of you are thinking, well, well Charles, I have prioritized. I'm moving toward prioritizing transformation, community, and mission in my life. I still need help because I have all these big decisions I want to make. How do I make them? Okay, great. By the way, that's a, that's a big topic. It's probably for another talk. I'm going to give you just kind of a quick summary, okay? A quick summary. I, first of all, I would recommend this book. Um, this is one of the best books I've, I've read on this topic. It's by my mentor, Bruce Waltke. It's called Finding the Will of God, A Pagan Notion. Um, just from the title, you can probably guess where I stole some of the ideas for today's talk from. Um, and uh, if, I, I highly recommend this book. So, so here's a big idea. Making sure, first of all, that you are prioritizing God's will in your life, right? Your transformation, your community, and your mission. Now, the question is, what exactly are you doing when you're trying to make decisions? 
Well, the answer is, you're not trying to find the ideal path. You're not trying to find the ideal path. Rather, in making decisions, you're seeking to reveal God's values and God's character. How do we do that? Number one, does it violate biblical principles? Right? The Bible draws lines about ethics. So when you make a decision, you're like, well, wait a minute, does this, does this go outside what, what the Bible says is okay? And then I'm, I'm not doing that. As simple as that. Of course, in, in, in putting this down, I'm assuming you read the Bible and you actually know what the Bible says. Number two, does it fit your gifting and passion? I met a lot of Christ followers who think that God's out to get them. Okay? Like, God is going to send them to places they don't want to go and make them do things they don't want to do. And I'm like, that's not who God is. God made you unique. He wants to use your unique talents and skills and gifting and passion and mold it within God's kingdom for the sake of his mission. So, no, God's not out to... So, so you, it's okay, look. This is assuming that you're being transformed by God, that your desires and your passion are aligned with God's. But as you're becoming mature as a Christ follower, you can trust more and more your gifting and your passion. Okay, that's what God wants for you. Number three. What does your community say? Um, this is assuming you have a community of Christ followers who knows you, who loves you, and you have given them permission to speak honestly into your life. Okay? And if you have that, awesome. It's a huge resource for you. And if you don't have that, God's will for you is to go find that. Okay? Number four. Is it wise? The book of James talks about this, right? Right in the first chapter one. If, if anybody need wisdom, ask God. He'll give it to you. God gives wisdom. So as you mature, as you, you figure things out, as you learn more about God's wisdom and how to think biblically, you can make decisions by weighing things. Is this po there's, there's good things, there's this bad things, there's positives and negatives. Weigh those things. Use wisdom that God's given you. And then finally... Leave room for God to speak, because it does happen, okay? It's happened to me. It's not the norm. You don't expect it with every decision, but it does happen. So leave room for God to speak about a particular decision. This is about decision-making, not seeking the perfect ideal path. This is about decision-making that reveals God's character and God's values. All right, let's pull it together. Um, what did we learn today? First thing. Not thinking about God's will and planning, that's arrogance. That's alizonia. In fact, James calls it evil. Okay. We didn't have time to get to that word. Um, and there are two solutions to arrogance that, that are kind of like, that are, not, that, that are false paths. One is don't plan. James doesn't say that at all. And the other one is magic phrase. If it's the Lord's will, to say that would be okay. Okay, none of those are, we don't go down those two, two routes. Okay, so what do we do? What, are, what is our next step? Number one, remember who you are. It always starts there. It always starts with identity. Who are we? We are people who don't know much about the future. We don't have much control about tomorrow. And I'll say it again, there's no guarantee that any of us will actually live to see tomorrow. So plan accordingly. Plan in accordance with the will of God. If you plan a life that aligns with God's will, what you're doing is you're focusing on your transformation, your participation, the flourishing of the community, and you're talking about the mission. So plan like this. <laughs> That's a good thing because God knows the future, right? Plan in accordance with his will. Now, how do we do that? How do we do that? Always start where you are. So, begin by looking at a calendar. I want to challenge you today. Okay, this week, for this week, find a time. You can find an hour, maybe half hour, an hour. Sit down and look at your calendar, maybe over the past month. Or if you don't have a calendar, make one. Ask yourself, where is your time going? Some of us very busy, family, work. Some of us, like, I'm doing a lot of video games, a lot of social media. 
put those things down, add those things up. Where are you in your priorities of your life? Where are you in your planning? And you can look at your calendar, you go, okay, is this a schedule that reflects somebody who is trying to live in accordance with the will of God? Does this schedule emphasize your transformation? Is it emphasizing your desire to know God more and trust God more and reveal who God is more? Is this a schedule that shows you care and you, your participation in the community of God's people? Is this a schedule that reflects God's heart for the lost world? Start there. We always start with where we are. And then what do you do? You make new plans. Right? You look at your plan, you go, okay, now, my, my current calendar, yeah, okay, no, really not, really it's not fitting with God's will, okay. Or maybe it's a little bit, or maybe it's somewhere, or maybe quite a bit. It doesn't matter. It does not matter, okay. You just need to be clear about where you are. And then what you do is you make a concrete small next step to move toward God's will in your life. Concrete small next step. Don't shoot for the moon. Like, don't, don't, don't do pie in the sky. That doesn't work. So, man, I, wanna, I feel like I don't pray enough. I pray once. I, my calendar says I pray once a week. Maybe I can maybe go to three times a week. I can do Monday, Wednesday, Friday on a, maybe 10 minutes in the morning you know, before I do breakfast. I maybe I can build that in somehow. Oh, oh I'm not reading the Bible enough. Gosh, you know, you know what? I can maybe do, a, do you know, Bible on, on audio. I was going to say Bible on tape, which sounds really funny. Um, <laughs> I can maybe drive, when I, when I go, when I commute, I can have the Bible being read to me. That would be pretty cool. A, a step like that. Or maybe community. I don't, you know, have, I don't have Christian community in my life. I need to join a community group. I, I need to get into a Bible study. Or maybe there's, there's this great person I know. He's a great Christ follower. I like to get to know that person more. I'm going to ask them out for coffee and get to know them. Or maybe I don't, I don't have anything toward God's mission. You know, Love Madison's coming up. Sign up for that. If you don't have ideas, you need more ideas, I recommend this page right here. Blockhawk's um, Next Step page has all kinds of ideas on how you can con follow Jesus, connect with, G with the community, learn more, and serve. All kinds of possibilities. Go there and come up with one single concrete next step that you can weave it into your planning for your life. Because we as Christ followers, we're called to be different from the world. So we have to plan to be different. Let me pray for us. <sighs> Father, we thank you for James, kind of. Uh, he says things that <laughs> hits us pretty hard. He says we're, we don't know things. We think we know. He says, he reminds us of our mortality. We don't like that very much. He calls us out for being arrogant, for thinking we know things that we don't. Father, we don't want to live there. We don't want to live in a place where we are th thinking more of ourselves than, than, than who we really are. Where we somehow get the idea that we have powers that we don't have. So help us look at ourselves carefully. This week, Father, bring to mind for us this challenge to look at our calendar, to assess our life, to see where we are, and ask us the question, are we prioritizing your will in our life in how we plan our days? Because we want to be people who are different. We want to be people who live out your will. And all God's people said, Amen.
sing that together. Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus at the center of it all. From beginning.
So we appreciate y'all as being here today worshiping with us. If you are trying to figure out all these different questions that you have, right, a, a great place for, especially if you're figuring out all these new things about church and Christianity and Jesus, Alpha is a great place. If you're trying to figure out these things about church and the mission of God, Next Steps is a great place. We'd love to connect with you there. Could you cup your hands in a posture of receiving? These last couple weeks, we've been uh, trying to memorize a passage from James. If you've got it memorized, try to do it from memory. But if not, that's okay. Read it with me. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, wherever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. May you go and be blessed in the name of Jesus, in his goodness and his, in his love. As you figure out what Jesus is calling you to. Sometimes you wish that God would just put it in the sky and it'd be easier that way. But Jesus is maturing us, growing us, even in that struggle of making those hard decisions, that we might be mature and complete. Go knowing that the Lord, even in your decisions, is growing you still. May you mature, may you grow, May you figure out what God's will is for you in this season. In Jesus' name, amen. Goodbye, friends. We'll see you all next week now. See you, see you, see you. Bye. We love you.